All right. Um, today we're going to uh, return to talking about kings. I'm going to uh, pick up where I was talking about yesterday. We talked about the structure of kings yesterday, and I'll review that briefly and then say a few things more about the overall uh, thrust of kings. And then we're going to go into several several main uh, topics of the book of Kings. Uh, we want to talk about the temple, uh, which plays a prominent role. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a, large, a large section of the uh, account of Solomon's reign is devoted to description of the temple. Uh, and then we want to talk about prophecy. I want to talk about prophecy. I don't care what you want to talk about. I want to talk about prophecy. And then I want to end by talking about uh, the divided kingdom and what that tells us. I think... Uh, the book of Kings is a, is a good book for uh, thinking about and working through questions about the unity of the church. Um, we're to be one body. We're to be one uh, with one another as the Father is one with the Son. Uh, and that's not the state of the church right now. And it wasn't the state of Israel during the time of the Kings. But Kings gives us a lot of insight into the causes and sources of disunity and vision. Uh, the temptations and dangers of certain kinds of unity, and then also gives us hope for God's purposes in uh, forming one body uh, among his people. <clears throat> so that's the plan. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly summarize what I was saying about the, or the arrangement of Kings yesterday afternoon, just to remind you where we were. Um, it's on that separate sheet that I had with the outline three narrative uh, sections, three main narrative sections that are kind of embedded in each other. Do you know what Rus Russian nesting dolls are? Okay. It's kind of like a Russian nesting doll. So you have the little Russian nesting doll set inside a bigger Russian nesting doll, which has the same shape as the little one, and then the next bigger one has the same shape. They all have the same shape, but they're kind of set in each other. So you have the big narrative of the, the whole history of Israel and the United Kingdom at the beginning and end of uh, kings. Within that you have the history of the northern kingdom which begins with Jeroboam the first and ends with the fall of Samaria to the Assyrians that's recorded in 2 Kings 17. And then within that the, the central section of the book of Kings is, has to do with the Omri dynasty that begins with Omri and then ends when Jehu is sent to take vengeance against the house of Omri. Those are similar in the sense that each one of those begins with a David-like character. David is the founder of the United Kingdom. Jeroboam I, whose life story resembles David's, is uh, the uh, founder of the Northern Kingdom. And then Omri, whose life also resembles David's life, is the founder of the Omri dynasty. Uh, Jeroboam I and Omri are not faithful as David is. They're both idolaters but they're, I call them counterfeit Davids. They're, they're David-like in their life story, but they're kind of an inverse, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the negative side of David. So the beginning of each section is similar. The end of each section is similar. The Amri dynasty ends with the end of the dynasty. The dynasty is wiped out by Jehu. All of Ahab's seed are, is wiped out. And there's a destruction of a temple. Uh, the northern kingdom ends the same way. There's the end of the last dynasty of the north, and eventually the shrines, the golden calf shrines that uh, Jeroboam sets up are destroyed. And the history of the United Kingdom ends in the same, in the same way. At least in the, it ends with the destruction of a sanctuary, a temple. Uh, and the other, the key point, the, the punchline, as I said, of Kings is that each of those endpoints, there's a threat to the Davidic line. The Davidic line is almost wiped out by Jehu and then Athaliah. Uh, and there is only one Davidic prince left, that's Joash, and he's an infant. And God preserves the Davidic line through that infant child, um, and the Davidic line continues. Uh, at the end of the northern kingdom, the Assyrians take over Samaria, and then they march into the south southern kingdom of Judah, and they besiege Jerusalem and almost take Jerusalem, but the Lord miraculously intervenes and delivers Jerusalem in response to the prayer of Hezekiah. So there's another threat to the Davidic line that the Lord saves them from. And then at the end of Kings, the very last thing in Kings is the Davidic king is in exile, Jehoiachin, uh, and he's in prison. 
uh, but there's a, an elevation of the Davidic king at the end of 2 Kings. He's given a seat at the king of Babylon's table. He's set above all the other, all the other uh, kings in Babylon. Babylon has taken over many different nations, and so they've taken many kings into exile, not just the kingdom, king of Judah. Uh, but the king of Judah is set up above the other kings, and he's given honor um, in Babylon. So there's a, there's a promise of a continuation of the line of David at the end. And I suggested that kings, uh, in, especially as we read it in the light of the New Testament, kings is primarily a gospel story. It's about God's faithfulness to his promise to David, and it's about the death and resurrection of the house of David. The house of David nearly dies, nearly ends several times, and God continuously rescues it. Every time it gets close to death, God rescues it. Uh, when Jesus comes, he's the Davidic king. He's the last and greatest of the Davidic kings. And he does actually die. Uh, and yet, that's not the end of the Davidic line. God's commitment to the Davidic line, his commitment to his covenant with David, is strong enough to even overcome death. Not just to rescue the Davidic line from near-death experiences, his commitment to the Davidic line is powerful, stronger than death. Love is stronger than death, more powerful than Sheol. Okay. God's love is stronger than death. So um, that's, that's the kind of positive side of what Kings is showing us as a, as a gospel narrative um, about God's faithfulness and about the death and resurrection of David. Uh, you can also read Kings as kind of a negative part of the gospel in the sense that uh, it exposes the failures, the weakness, the impotent, the ultimate impotence of everything, every other possible savior or means of salvation for Israel. The only thing that saves Israel, as we, we said at the end yesterday, the only thing that saves Israel is God's faithfulness, God's commitment, God's mercy. It's not because of the skill or the faithfulness of Judah or the Davidic line. It's only God's faithfulness. But you can see uh, the... the uh, the book of Kings also highlights the weakness and impotence of other means of national salvation and national preservation. Uh, you can read it, for example, as a, uh, a wisdom book. You can read Kings as a book about wisdom. Wisdom is a quality of kings. You have the wisdom literature arise in the period of the Davidic, the Davidic monarchy. Wisdom is a Wisdom comes to prominence during the lion phase of Israel's history. Ox, lion, eagle, man. Ox, lion, eagle. Right? Ox, lion, eagle. Ox, lion. Lion is, the, lion is the kingly phase, the Davidic phase. And that's when you get wisdom literature. You got Proverbs, you got Ecclesiastes, you have Song of Songs, which is wisdom literature, even though it doesn't look like it. Uh, you have wisdom literature. Solomon is the wise king. Um, and uh, uh, particularly Proverbs, Proverbs is, uh, is the wisdom book, uh, perhaps par excellence, but it's a, wisdom, it's a wisdom book that's directed to kings. The whole setup of Proverbs is Solomon, primarily Solomon, instructing his son, who is the prince, in proper uh, royal wisdom. If you want to, you, you want to learn justice, and the ways of truth and faithfulness. Listen to my wisdom. That's what Solomon is saying to his son. Uh, but it's the king talking to the prince. Wisdom literature is, for, is literature for kings. It's literature for rulers. Uh, but the book of, the, the book of kings, uh, more than it instructs in wisdom, exposes the ultimate impotence of wisdom. Uh, how does it do that? It does that by emphasizing the wisdom of Solomon at the beginning of the book, the opening section of first 11 chapters of First Kings are about Solomon, about the transition from David to Solomon, uh, Solomon's uh, accession and, and, con and, uh, and coronation as king, and then his reign. That's the first 11 chapters of First Kings. Uh, and wisdom is a very prominent theme in those chapters. Solomon receives wisdom from God. His wisdom is displayed in his... Uh, skill and shrewdness in judgment. Kings are judges, and he passes judgment in the case of the prostitutes. His wisdom is displayed in his organization of the building of the temple. 
if you are engaged in a massive construction project, like a temple, uh, you, that requires uh, wisdom of various sorts. You have to know how to organize people. You, know how to, you have to know how to delegate to skilled people. Wisdom, uh, you have to have wisdom to negotiate deals with, um, as Solomon does with Hiram, the king of Tyre, so that he can get the right materials from Tyre that he doesn't have in Israel. Uh, the whole temple building process is a display of wisdom. And as I mentioned yesterday or the day before, when the Queen of Sheba comes, she's, her, 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 uh, she, has no, she has no breath in her. It's, it's, her, it's uh, breathtaking to see how Solomon's kingdom works. Uh, and she's amazed at the wisdom that he's able to give her. So uh, uh, it's all about wisdom. Solomon is the wise king. Solomon is the model wise king. But <laughs> Solomon's reign ends with uh, a series uh, of uh, acts of unfaithfulness, right? Uh, the three things, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. The three things that kings are forbidden to do in Deuteronomy 17 are multiply, Wives, horses and chariots. What was the third one? Wives, yeah, gold. Uh, guns, gold, and girls. I used to play a game with my kids, see if we could go through the alphabet and take each letter and use the letters for the three prohibitions of the king. So let's see, uh, bombs, babes, and baubles. Can't multiply any of those. Anyway, uh, you might not want to try that because it might get into uh, it might get into uncertain territory. Anyway, yeah, gun gold, gun, guns, gold, and girls. He's not to multiply horses and chariots. Horses and chariots are weapons of aggressive uh, imperial war. The king is there to defend Israel. He's not supposed to be an imperialist. Uh, he's not supposed to be multiplying wives, partly because he's supposed to show some sexual self-restraint, but he's also not supposed to multiply wives because he's not supposed to enter into alliances with other nations. That's what, that's what a harem is about. It's not just about sexual gratification. It's about political alliances. And he's not to, supposed to multiply wealth because then he'll rely on his wealth. Solomon breaks all of those. Okay? He starts buying horses and chariots, where does he buy them from? Anybody remember? Egypt. Egypt, right. So it's bad enough for him to start multiplying, thank you, horses and chariots. That's bad enough. But then he's doing it by uh, entering into these commercial deals for weaponry with Egypt. It's like a return to Egypt. And that's, that's why after his reign, Jeroboam comes along. And he, he's, Jeroboam so, sounds kind of like a Moses, let my people go. Uh, Solomon, you've turned Israel into an Egypt, and Jeroboam is like a Moses leading ten tribes out of the oppressive regime of, uh, of uh, Solomon. So he, he's multiplying horses and chariots, uh, and particularly taking them from Egypt. He multiplies gold and silver. He brings in, but you know how much, how many talents of gold does Solomon bring in every year? It's a number that will be familiar when I say it. 666 talents of gold. It's the only other place in the Bible other than Revelation uh, 13 that uses that number. Solomon brings in 666 talents of gold annually. That's a huge, um, huge amount of gold. Uh, so he's multiplying gold and silver. In fact, he mul multiplying silver. Pfft, silver is nothing during the reign of Solomon. It's, it said silver is like a common stones because there's so much gold and so much silver that it's not even silver is not even worth talking about. And then the worst thing, the thing that really causes him to fall, is the multiplication of wives. So, uh, so 300 wives, 700 concubines, a thousand total. Uh, and uh, according to 1 Kings 11, they do exactly what Deuteronomy 17 warns, which is to draw him away from worshiping the Lord. That's what Deuteronomy 17 says. If a king marries foreign wives, then he'll be seduced to worship the gods and serve the gods of his foreign wives. 
You know, if he falls in love with, uh, you know, you can fall in love with 300 women, right? A thousand, perhaps. <laughs> uh, he falls in love with his wife who's a worshiper of Molech. Then he's going to be drawn to, yeah, I'll, I'll help you worship Molech, which is what Solomon does. I mean, he, uh, he builds the temple of, temple of the Lord, but he spends the latter part of his reign building shrines to false gods, to idols, to satisfy his wives. Okay. Now, uh, remember, Solomon is the wise king. In fact, the, the words for wisdom are used in the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings and never used again all the way through 1 and 2 Kings. After 1 Kings, I don't know, probably 1 Kings 10 is the last time they're used. After Solomon's reign, the word, that, the word group for wisdom is never used again. There's another, never another wise king. And the wisest king doesn't really, he, he can't preserve the kingdom as a unified kingdom. His wisdom doesn't keep him from uh, breaking every one of the rules of kingship. So uh, insofar as Kings is a wisdom book, it's exposing the limits of human wisdom. Human wisdom, uh, uh, you can achieve a lot with wisdom, as Solomon does. But it's not sufficient in and of itself to preserve Israel and to realize God's purposes. Uh, the, the, the wisdom book that seems to resemble the message of kings most closely is the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's also a wisdom book, but it's a very different kind of wisdom book than the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs, uh, in Proverbs, Solomon is telling his son, if you do this, you will succeed. If you cling to wisdom, you will prosper. Uh, when uh, uh, later, uh, it seems later in his life, Solomon writes Ecclesiastes, and he realizes the limits of wisdom, he pursued wisdom, he pursued knowledge, he pursued all of these great projects and plans, uh, and then realizes that he doesn't have any control over any of it. The recurring phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes is vapor of vapors, everything is vapor. Uh, it's sometimes translated as vanity of vanities, all is vanity, but uh, I think the better translation is vapor. Vapor of vapors, all is vapor. Uh, everything is like vapor, your life is vapor. Uh, you live for a time and then you disappear and you're gone. Your achievements are like vapor. Your wealth like vapor. You put your wealth in the stock market. You put your money in the stock market and then it collapses. You know, and it's gone. It takes wings. You preserve your wealth. You're careful about preserving your wealth and then you pass it on to your children as an inheritance but you have no control over whether they're going to be wise in the way they use the wealth that you've accumulated or not. So Ecclesiastes is about the limits of wisdom in a world that, you're, that you can't control. God controls the world, but you can't. Um, and Kings has a similar kind of message. Even though Solomon is the great king of wisdom, wisdom is not sufficient. Uh, that's not what preserves Israel. That's not what saves the house, the house of uh, David. Yep. Yes, to a certain extent, the wealth, his wealth is, is a blessing of God, right? And I think the, the fact that he has a palace, the fact that he is living like a king, I don't think that's, that's the sin. But there is a sin in excessive accumulation of wealth. Uh, and that's, I think, the, what Deuteronomy 17 is prohibiting. And Solomon is doing that. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Well, I'm saying that because that's the way the Bible describes him. And in a lot of ways, his kingdom and rule is characterized by wisdom. But you're right. I mean, he's, uh, his wisdom fails, and that's the point I'm making, that uh, even, the, even the highest levels of wisdom uh, don't, keep him from, don't keep him from falling. There's, there needs to be something more to preserve the Davidic kingdom and to, to, to uh, realize God's purposes for Israel. So uh, this, I mean, this is one way to think about how the Old Testament anticipates Christ. It does it by foreshadowing Christ. Solomon is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Je Jesus says some, something greater than Solomon is here. I'm a greater king than Solomon. So in that sense, Solomon's wisdom and his reign foreshadows the life of Jesus. On the other hand, it's the failure of Solomon that leaves Israel recognizing their need of a king better than Solomon. So the failure of Solomon's wisdom 
points Israel ahead to a king who's be, who will be wiser, who in fact, the king who is going to be the, the incarnation of God's wisdom. I think I can make this point briefly. Remember yesterday we were talking about Cyrus and Cyrus taking up the, some of the Davidic responsibility for Israel. Uh, I think that's the situation of Israel throughout the, the post-exilic and post-exilic period. These Gentile powers have that kind of quasi-Davidic role. So I, th I think the, the beast that's being numbered in Revelation is the Roman Empire. But uh, they are a quasi-Davidic empire because they're supposed to be taking care of Israel. And their 666, it's not the only thing that 666 means, but it's, it links it to Solomon because the, uh, the Roman Empire is failing in its vocation with regard to Israel. Uh, and they're, a, they're an apostate, a failed king as, as Solomon is. I think there's making a link between, between the failed, Davidic, uh, failed Roman Empire, the empire that turns against the people of God and Solomon's failure as king. Yeah, so on, in Revelation we have um, three, three, well, let's say four main enemies of, of the people of God. There's the dragon, who is Satan. And the dragon calls out the beast from the sea, uh, the beast from the land, and then there's also the harlot city. So the dragon, Satan, and then three satanic powers that oppose the people of God. And I think those are all referring to uh, enemies that the early church faced in the first century, the Roman Empire and uh, Jewish persecutors. But I think they can also, they also function as types or models of uh, uh, political powers and religious, uh, apostate religion that you know, recurs all the way through history. So I mean, uh, what, what you have in Revelation 13 is an alliance between the sea beast, which is the Roman Empire, and the land beast, which I think is representing Jews who ally with the Roman Empire. In, in persecuting Christians. Jews and Romans ganged up on Jesus. And in the first century, Jews, Jews and Romans ganged up on the, on the apostles and their followers. Uh, but that's, that happened, I think the prophecy is about the first century, but that kind of alliance happens all the time. I mean, you think about, well, <laughs> gr grab something right out of today's headlines. Uh, Vladimir Putin has the full support of the Russian Orthodox Church for his invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, there's been a split, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church split off from the Russian Orthodox Church and claimed independence a few years ago. The Russian Orthodox Church doesn't want the Ukrainian Orthodox Church to be independent. So they support Putin going in and taking over Ukraine because then they can reunite the church. So you have a religious beast supporting the, the uh, political beast. That kind of alliance, you have it in the Soviet era, you have it in Nazi Germany, I'm sure you have it in many places in Africa. Whenever you find a tyrant, they're gonna be, they're gonna be religious people who are, and Christians particularly, who are fully supportive of the tyrant. So yeah, I think it's, it's a recurring pattern. The, the prophecy of Revelation I think is referring to specific, a specific set of events but it's a recurring pattern in history. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we could talk about Revelation the rest of the day, but we're not gonna. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, this is one part of the negative message of kings. Uh, the wisest king ever, the one wise king that Israel ever had can't preserve Israel because he's still in the flesh, he falls. He breaks the commandments of God for king, kings. Um, another uh, kind of negative message of kings. Um, the one person in the history of Israel who is who obeying the command of Deuteronomy 6, the first great commandment. first great commandment is... Jesus' first great commandment. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Okay. That's the first thing, the greatest commandment. That's, Jesus didn't make that up. That's from Deuteronomy 6. 
And the second great commandment, love your neighbors yourself, Jesus didn't make that up either. That's from Leviticus uh, 19. Okay. So the first great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That is the, uh, that is the standard of obedience that every Israelite is supposed to, re, uh, supposed to aspire to and reach. There's only one man in the history of Israel who has ever said to reach that standard. And that is, anybody know? It's one of the kings. Anybody know who it is? It's one of the kings of Judah who loves the Lord his God with all his heart and with all his soul and all his mind. Is it King David? It's not. <laughs> it, could have, it could be, but it's not. What's that? In Kings. It's in Kings. Josiah. Josiah. Excellent. Were you going to say that? Okay. Josiah. This is in 2 Kings 23. Uh, Josiah removed the mediums, verse 24, and the spiritists and the teraphim and the idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might confirm the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Okay, the background of that, just to remind you, uh, Josiah becomes king and he starts to reform. He clean, he's cleansing out the temple. And when he's cleaning up the temple, they discover the law, which has been neglected during the 52-year reign of, year reign of Manasseh. The book of the law has been lost. And Josiah recovers it. And then he realizes that Judah is in huge danger uh, from God's judgment because they've been disobeying the law. So he begins enforcing the law. That's what, it, that's what this is talking about. And verse 25 says, Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to the law of Moses. Nor did any like him arise after him. Josiah is a perfect law-keeping king. Which means Judah's going to survive because they, now they have a king who keeps the law with all his heart and soul. And all his... Well then, verse 26. However, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger burned against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. Manasseh is uh, one of Josiah's predecessors. Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, and then Josiah. Um, and the Lord is still angry at Manasseh's sins. And even though Josiah has reformed the temple, restored the temple, even though he's enforcing the law, even though he himself keeps the law, it's too late. And that law keeping, that perfect law keeping that Josiah has isn't enough to save Judah. The Lord is still angry because of Manasseh and they're still doomed. They're still going to be taken into exile and all the curses are going to come on them. Yeah? Yeah, by, by this time, Assyri yeah, the Syrians have already taken over. What's that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure what they're called at the time. So, what, it's, it's what becomes Samaria in the New Testament. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I'm asking if the people, are the people of Samaria, those who in the New Testament, that they speak Hebrew, not necessarily Right, that's right. Correct. Uh, not all of them, correct. Yeah, it's a, it's a mixed, it's a mixed, thank you. Uh, it's a mixed population in the north, correct, yes. And that's, that is the predecessor to what is called in the New Testament, the Samar uh, Samaritans, Samaria. Um, but uh, even, even as far as Judah is concerned, this, the focus of this passage is about uh, Josiah and Judah. Um, he's removing the abominations of the idols from Judah and Jerusalem, and in spite of that, in spite of his, in his perfect record, as it were, uh, that law-keeping is not enough to preserve Judah from destruction. Uh, I mean, in, in this case, it comes too late because the Lord has already, Manasseh has already stepped over the line. And there comes a time when uh, the kings have gone past the point of restoration and repentance. And even the most radical reform, Josiah's, is not enough. But that's, in, in an important way, it's exposing the weakness of the law to preserve Israel. Um, as, just as wisdom is insufficient, so also the law is insufficient. Um, 
I mean, there's the, the, if you look at the whole Bible, there's a, 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 there are a different dimensions of that, of that question. So the second commandment says God visits uh, the iniquity of the fathers of the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Uh, Ezekiel 18 says if you have um, an unfaithful father and his son repents, he's not held guilty for his father's sins. So those two things are in some somewhat intention. I think the I think the way to resolve it is th- this is the way I would resolve it. Um, the consequences of the sins of the fathers continue on and are visited to the third and fourth generation. So um, I mean, think back to Adam. Uh, Adam sinned and was cast out of the garden. Cain and Abel were born. They didn't get to go back into the garden and start over. Uh, even though they hadn't sinned at, at, as Adam did, they still bore the consequences of Adam's sin. Um, I mean, David's sin with Bathsheba has consequences for his sons. That's, that's visiting his... I didn't say this yesterday, but it's, uh, one of the things that's going on in Samuel is that David's sons repeat his sins, uh, but more overtly and violently. Uh, David doesn't rape Bathsheba. Amnon rapes. Tamar. And then Absalom, after he takes over Jerusalem, uh, takes all of David's concubines and sets up a, uh, uh, a little uh, a, a, a bordello, a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Where do, where do, where do you find prostitutes? I'm not, that you're, not that you're looking for prostitutes. What the, what's the word for the, the place where prostitutes operate? Yeah, brothel. That's what I'm looking for. Sends up a, sets up a brothel, as it were, publicly sleeping with all of the women in David's, David's concubines. So David's sin of adultery is intensified by his sons. So uh, that's, a, that's a kind of visiting of the sin of the fathers upon the sons. Uh, but if you have, so you, uh, you have Adam's sins cast out of the garden. Abel is faithful. Abel's not held guilty uh, of the same sin as Adam is, but he still pays the consequences of Adam's sin because he's, out, he's kept outside of the garden. So I, that's, the, that's the way I would try to work through that. I also, the other part of that third and fourth generation thing is interesting in the way it works out in Kings. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, you have the contrast in the second commandment between the iniquity of the fathers visited on the sons to the third and fourth generation. But God is uh, faithful to a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. I mean, that's a huge disparity. Uh, and there's a, a sense in which visiting the iniquity for three or four generations is a mercy. He's not going to visit the iniquity of the fathers for a thousand generations. Blessing goes for a thousand generations, but not curse. And that's part of the dynamic, part of the pattern in Kings. Uh, uh, I don't think any of the Northern Kingdom's dynasties last more than four generations. They go for about four generations, they're cut off. And then another dynasty rises and goes four generations, it's cut off. Um, maybe there might be one or two that goes somewhat further. But I think that's, they're, they're committing sins against the second commandment. But the Lord, in a sense, is arresting their sin by, by stopping it after three, three or four generations. They don't get as bad as they could possibly be. I mean, you think about what would have happened to the house of Omri if they had continued for 15 generations. I mean, if you've got... Somebody like Ahab in the second generation, they're just going to get worse and worse and worse. But God cuts them off before they can get as bad as they possibly could. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think that this is, this is an example. Manasseh's sin is still, uh, God still remembers Manasseh's sins. And in spite of, Josiah, Josiah is uh, rescued from uh, suffering those consequences in his lifetime. Right. When he starts applying the law and cleansing the temple, uh, he's told, because you repented, you won't suffer the consequences in your lifetime, but the curse is still going to come on Judah. It's that by that time, it's, it's, um, it's beyond, they've crossed the line and God is gonna, God is gonna bring exile, yeah. Yeah, yes, right, good. Yeah, the, the, like the sin of the Amorites is not yet full, but the sin of Judah has become full, and at that point, there's uh, God is God is going to bring judgment, uh, and uh, there's uh, 
individuals and generations might delay that, but it's, it's going to come. Yeah, that's a, that's a good analogy also. Uh, the, other, the last thing I want to say kind of negatively, and this will bring us into the next point for discussion. Um, the, the, the other um, institution, we have the wisdom, we have the law. The other thing that is uh, exposed as an insufficient savior for, for Judah is the temple. Uh, the temple, the presence of the temple doesn't save Judah from exile and from destruction. Um, we're going to go, we're going to talk about the temple at some length, but let me just put this in terms of Jeremiah. Uh, I talked about Jeremiah's temple sermon uh, yesterday, I think, where Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 7, and he uh, says that the same thing that happened to Shiloh the, the tabernacle at Shiloh is going to happen to the to Solomon's temple. Uh, go go to Shiloh, and that that'll tell you what the future of Solomon's temple is. But in the course of that in the course of that sermon, he uh, he ex- explains or uh, he um, expresses the attitude of the people of Jerusalem toward the temple. And uh, what he quotes is a kind of chant or refrain. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Do you remember that from Jeremiah? This is what the people say. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. How can the Babylonians possibly defeat us if we've got the Lord's house in our capital city? We've got the temple of the Lord. So we're, we're invulnerable. We can't be beaten. But the temple is not going to save them unless they're faithfully worshiping the God who dwells in the temple. And what Jeremiah, Jeremiah is especially attacking uh, is the, uh, the way that the, the people of Judah use the temple as a kind of safe house. Uh, this is what he means when he calls the, he says, you've turned the temple into a den of thieves. Um, uh, the den, uh, uh, a thieves' den, is not where thieves steal. A thieves' den is where thieves go after they've stolen, to be safe from people who are trying to catch them. Right? It's a safe house. Uh, it's their, uh, it's the, where they collect their treasures. That's how the people of Judah are treating the temple. Uh, Jeremiah accuses them of adultery, idolatry, breaking all of the commandments of God outside the temple abusing the poor outside the temple. And then they come into the temple and they go through the rituals of the temple and they think, we're safe. As long as we're doing the sacrifices and as long as we have the house sitting in in Jerusalem, everything's fine. And Jeremiah says, no, that's not the case. If you're using the temple as uh, as a den of thieves or using the worship, the sacrificial worship as a way of protecting you we're screening you from God's scrutiny. It's not going to work. Okay. Uh, yeah. When you bring a sacrifice, uh, if, you're, if you're a thief, if you're uh, an employer who doesn't pay his employees, that's something that the law requires and that the prophets condemn. If, you, if you're somebody who doesn't pay his employees and then you come into the temple with a sacrifice, God hates that sacrifice doesn't matter if you go through all the right motions because the sacrifice is not just what you're doing in the temple. It's the whole, uh, it's the whole life that you're bringing into the temple and offering to God. So what you do outside the temple is crucial for what happens in the temple. So the temple can't save Israel so long as Israel is disobeying God's commandments and being unfaithful. Uh, and the, the people of Jerusalem have turned the temple into a kind of magic, mag, uh, into a kind of... Uh, a magic uh, building that will protect them from God's wrath, and it won't. And in fact, if you if you go ahead into Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel is prophesying in Babylon about the same time that Jeremiah is prophesying in uh, Jerusalem. And in a sequence of visions in uh, Ezekiel eight through ten, Ezekiel is taken into the temple. He sees the idolatry of the temple. And then he watches as the glory of the Lord leaves the most holy place 
goes out to the courtyard, across the Kidron Valley, to the Mount of Olives, and continues east, going to Babylon, where, which is where uh, Ezekiel encounters the glory. Right? The glory of the Lord is not in the house anymore because of the way the people of Jerusalem are abusing the temple. The temple as a building is not going to save them as long as they're not uh, living faithfully before the Lord. So living and worshiping faithfully. So uh, Jeremiah is saying you can't, you can't live unfaithfully outside the temple and think that this temple service is going to protect you. By the same token, you can't break God's commandments in the temple and think that God is going to be pleased. You have to God has told you how you're supposed to approach him. If you don't do that, then you're going to be condemned for that. Obedience outside the temple and obedience inside the temple, there should be this uh, coherence between the way you live outside worship and the way you worship. And that's what's broken in Israel. And as long as that's broken, the temple is not going to protect uh, Judah from eventual exile and destruction. Okay, so those things are uh, kind of the negative side of the gospel story of kings. So uh, the wisdom of Solomon can't save them. The kingdom is divided. Uh, the temple doesn't save them uh, because they abuse the temple. The, uh, the law came of Josiah doesn't save them. It's too late because of the unfaithfulness of his predecessors. The only thing, only thing that can preserve Judah, the only thing that can preserve the Davidic line is God's faithfulness to his promise. That's the only thing. And God's power to overcome death. God is the God of resurrection. Always, always, from the beginning of the Bible, God is the God of resurrection. The God who brings things out of nothing and the God who brings life from the dead. Resurrection is not a New Testament idea. It's a biblical idea. God is the God of life. Yeah, uh, priests are servants of the house. Uh, Priests are servants of the sanctuary. So, yes, and in the Mosaic era, that's what you have. You have priests that are serving in the tabernacle. When you get a king, the king is the builder of the sanctuary who provides for the materials for the building, oversees the building, uh, and has some role in, by, in ensuring the priests continue to service properly. So yeah, when you get the king, the king is a political figure, but he still has a crucial role to play in maintaining the, uh, the, the uh, integrity of worship and of the temple. Uh, physical, the physical integrity, right? It's always the kings who repair the physical temple. When, it gets, when, it gets, when it's neglected, it's, it's righteous kings who put the temple back together. So, uh, and then, yes, once the temple is destroyed, where is the presence of God? I mean, where do you go to have contact with God? Where does that glory reside? And I think you're exactly right. It's residing with, with prophets. Um, and let me see if I can find the passage that's a, a neat little illustration of that. Talk among yourselves. Well, I, while I grope around, where is this, where is this, where is this? I'm thinking of the story of Elisha. Yes. Yeah. 2 Kings 4, Elisha. It's the prophet. Um, uh, follows Elijah. We'll talk about Elijah and Elisha in um, more detail later this morning. But in 2 Kings 4, uh, Elisha passed over to Shunem. This is verse 8. There was a prominent woman. She persuaded him to eat food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, she turned in there to eat food. He turned in there to eat food, rather. So uh, she said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man passing by us continually. A holy man. A consecrated man. A man who's uh, claimed by God. Please, let us make a little walled upper chamber, put a bed in there and a table and a chair and a lampstand, and it shall be when he comes to us that she, he shall turn in there. Yeah. There's no bed in the temple. But the other furniture that she's putting in there is temple furniture. A table, yeah, there's a table in the temple. A chair, the ark is a throne. A lampstand, a lampstand in the temple. It's an upper room. And this holy man is going to occupy the upper room when he comes through Shunem. 
Uh, and in a couple of these scenes, I don't know if this, I won't keep reading because I'm not sure this is the right one. But when people come to visit Elisha, they stand on the other side of the doorway. They don't come into his presence. But Gehazi, his servant, is kind of a mediator coming back and forth. He talks to the woman, comes in and brings a message to Elisha and goes back out. Elisha is kind of in this, this room has become a kind of small temple area. Elisha is the holy man who bears the glory of God with him. And then the approach to Elisha is kind of like the approach of a worshiper to Yahweh through the priests. Gehazi is kind of a priestly figure that's mediating between the woman and Elisha. Uh, so that's, I think that's, uh, that, that's one illustration of what you're talking about. But I think that's true of, yeah, of uh, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, he sees the glory of the Lord and the glory is with the people of God. And I think, yes, especially with the prophets. So I think you just kind of see this migration of the glory from the house that's uh, maintained and serviced by priests, the house that the kings build and maintain, and then prophets. And then, of course, in the New Covenant, we are the temple. We're the prophetic community. The glory of God is the, the Spirit comes and dwells among us. And we're the ones who bear the glory of God before the world. You know. Okay. Very good. Very good thought. Any other thoughts before we start looking at the temple in more detail? Uh, have you uh, 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 talked in detail about the tabernacle? No? Okay. So um, before we start talking about the temple, let's talk about the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle is the predecessor, obviously, to the temple. I should have uh, thought of... All right. I should have thought of uh, getting a diagram in your notes, but I didn't. Okay. This is a very rough diagram of a tabernacle. The tabernacle is a tent. Uh, the tent is uh, this area. This, the, the proportions are not right. I, I didn't, this is not to scale. But the, the, the covered part, the, the actual tabernacle is here, and it's surrounded by a courtyard. The courtyard is not covered. It's just a curtain that's put up on poles surrounding it. Okay. It has an east-west orientation. The gateway of the doorway of the tabernacle is off to the east. Okay. So that's one of the indications that we're, in a gar we're back in the garden-like setting. So if you're, if you're moving into the tabernacle courts, you're moving from east to west, which is the movement of return from outside the garden, inside the garden. Uh, there are other indications within the tabernacle system that you're entering into, the gar into a kind of a reconstituted garden area. Uh, I'll just, just stop, pause there and take note that when the tabernacle was built at the foot of Sinai, this is the first time since, uh, since Eden that anyone has approached as near to the glory of God as Adam was. Aaron is a new Adam who's allowed to go into the house of God and, and work in this garden area Everybody else has been excluded. The Lord has appeared to people, but you haven't had a permanent place where the Lord dwells. This is, this is, a, this is the beginning of the restoration of Eden in the world. Okay. So you go to the courtyard. In the outer court here, you have, that's an altar. doesn't look like an altar, but it is. Uh, that's the bronze altar. That's the altar where all of the animal offerings are placed and burned. So... Um, this is the circle here is, represents a labor. So it's a bowl of, for washing, full of water for washing. Uh, the priests will wash their hands and feet before they enter to the tent. Water from that labor also is used to wash the sacrifices. Sacrifices have to be purified. Uh, this area uh, is the court, and it's uh, an area that's open to all Israelites. If you're an Israelite worshiper and not a priest, if you want to offer a sacrifice, you bring your animal through this, through this gateway into this area of the tabernacle, the court. If you're just a lay worshiper and not a priest, you can't go into the tent itself. You never go in there. Only priests go in there. So uh, this is the holy place. This is the most holy place. And in the holy place, so only priests are going in here, and the, the holy place is, has... Three, three items of furniture in it. 
In the north, there's a, a, a table. It's a table made out of wood that's overlaid with gold. And there's uh, 12 loaves of bread on the, uh, the showbread on the table, representing the tribes of Israel. Uh, there's uh, incense on the loaves. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some kind of drink. Uh, uh, the, when the Bible talks, the Bible has, uh, talks a lot about wine, but also talks about strong drink. Uh, but strong drink in, uh, in biblical language is not, uh, it's not whiskey. It's not gin. Uh, they, I don't know when distilled liquor started to be used, but the ancient, ancient world did not have distilled liquor, distilled uh, alcohol. So this would be some kind of grain product, a fermented grain, some kind of beer. Okay. So beer and wine is what, what's, uh, uh, some kind of drink is out here on the table. So you've got bread, bread, and, bread and wine or bread and beer out on the table. Uh, on the south side, you have the lampstand. The lampstand is the menorah. Uh, is, uh, looks like a seven-branched tree. It has a, a central post and then three branches that run through it and, and stick out on either side. And the description in Exodus indicates that it, it's supposed to look like a tree. The, the, these sections are called branches. The parts on them are called buds. It's a golden tree that has fire on it. Okay. Moses. Moses in the burning bush. This is like a permanent burning bush, right? Um, and then you have an altar of incense uh, that's just before the curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place. The altar of incense is made of wood. It's overlaid with gold. So you're moving from bronze out in the courtyard to gold things in here. Uh, things get more valuable the further you go in. They get more glorious. You're moving from glory. Bronze is glorious. It's sparkly and shiny. Gold is more glorious. It's heavier. It's more expensive. Into the most holy place where you have solid gold materials in the most holy place. There's, as you advance to the presence of God, the materials of the furniture gets more glorious and expensive. So the altar of incense here, uh, you never put animal offerings on that altar. Uh, sometimes blood is put on that altar, but the only thing that's burned on that altar is incense. Uh, and you uh, probably have a censer. It's not, probably not burned on the, on the top of the altar. You have a censer, a bowl of incense that's placed on top, and you have incense burning. I was... Uh, I was quite uh, delighted to go into a restaurant on Monday and walk in and see this kind of smoky haze through the restaurant and discover that the restaurant was full of incense, burning incense in the corner. Is that, that's uh, it's it's common, yeah, interesting. So that's the kind of atmosphere you would have if, if the priest enters into the holy place, that's the kind of atmosphere he's entering. Because uh, they're, they're offering incense every morning and evening, they're trimming the lampstand every morning and evening, they're going there, have daily duties inside the holy place, and it's suffused with this aroma, uh, and then you also have the, the golden light of the, of the lampstand. Uh, and then you go into the most holy place, which is uh, where the ark is. That's the only item of furniture in the most holy place. And the ark is uh, made up, well, you know what the ark is, because you can go see it, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's... Uh, I, uh, I was going to explain that the ark is a throne, uh, and I think when he, uh, yeah, there's several things going on there uh, uh, in, at the end of Revelation 11, but uh, I think it's a, another way of describing the throne that was revealed in, earlier in Revelation. Uh, when, when John first goes up into heaven, he sees the throne uh, at, surrounded, by, surrounded by 24 thrones, uh, and I think that's, that's what he's seeing again in Revelation 11. So the, the original the original heavenly model for the ark is uh, the throne that John sees in Revelation. Um, so yeah, the, the ark is, uh, t uh, actually has two pieces to it. The, the lower part is a box made out of wood that's overlaid inside and outside with gold. Uh, and then you have a, a covering that's solid gold. And the covering has two cherubim worked into it that stretch their wings up uh, and are turned to face one another and then the strings, uh, wings are stretched up sh overshadowing the ark. And uh, that, that is the, uh, that's the throne of Yahweh. The glory of Yahweh 
is said to be enthroned. He's enthroned above the cherubim of the ark. Um, so we have a, one way to think about the tabernacle is we have a throne room for Yahweh in the, in the inner court, the, the most holy place. We have a kind of um, a, a, a living area, a living room. Uh, and we have a kitchen where his food is prepared out in the, out of the courtyard. Uh, this, I mean, this, this, uh, the tabernacle has many levels of symbolism. I refer you again to James Jordan's book, uh, Through New Eyes, where he discusses this at length. Uh, in, so, in one sense, this is also a kind of holy mountain. It's an architectural holy mountain. And even though it, you don't, the tabernacle is a tent, so you, it doesn't have stories, but, uh, you're symbolically moving from the foot of the mountain up toward the glory. So when the high priest goes into the most holy place, he is following the path of Moses, going into the presence of the, of the glory cloud. Moses went up into the mountain to go into the glory. The high priest goes into the most holy place, which is a, a kind of permanent architectural mountaintop. Okay. So that's, that's a, a quick summary of what's in the tabernacle what the tabernacle looks like. And the, the temple is, has basically the same form. The temple has the same three sections, an outer court, a first sanctuary, and an inner court that, uh, that uh, are the, uh, 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 virtually identical to the court of the tabernacle, the holy place, and the most holy place. The outer court is not covered the temple itself is just the holy place and the most holy place. Uh, in Kings, the, the names of those different sections of the temple, are the names are different than they are in Exodus and Leviticus. Uh, the courtyard in, what's called the courtyard in uh, Exodus and Leviticus is called the porch uh, in Kings. What is called the holy place in Leviticus and Exodus is called the hekal, that's the Hebrew word, which is a word for palace. That's, that's the, uh, uh, the word for uh, the holy place in Kings. The holy place of the temple is called the Hekal. And then the most holy place is called the Debir, um, which um, uh, is, it's, uh, the root of Debir is the word for word or speak or oracle. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, idea seems to be that the holy the most holy place is described as the debir because that's where god 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 is enthroned and reveals himself uh it's where he's uh giving oracles so but the same they're basically the same three sections uh you've got an outer section you've got an uh, a an inner uh, a first sanctuary where the priests work you have the inner sanctuary the high priest goes into the inner sanctuary the debir the most holy place only once a year on the day of atonement uh, so, it, basic structure, you're, what you have in the temple is just, a, it's just the same as the tabernacle, but there are a number of things that are obviously different about the temple. It's not a tent. It's a, a permanent building. It's supposed to be a permanent building. It's not supposed to move from place to place, but eventually it kind of does, because at the end of Kings, Nebuchadnezzar is carting away all of the furniture uh, back to Babylon. Uh, and then the, when, the, when the exile ends, the people cart it back from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Uh, but it's a, it's a permanent building. It's much larger than the tabernacle. Uh, it's made of different materials, obviously. It doesn't have curtains as for the walls. Um, I should say the tabernacle is not just a curtain or, or, or a fabric tent. Uh, the tabernacle has wooden walls and the curtains uh, are uh, covering over those wooden walls. Uh, but the, the temple is made of stone. Uh, it's permanent, it's bigger, um, it's, um, yeah, those are the, those are the most obvious things uh, that uh, distinguish it from the, uh, from the tabernacle. Uh, but then there are, there, there are uh, specific things that make it different. That is, there are items of furniture in the temple that are not in the tabernacle. Uh, if you turn to 1 Kings 6, I'll just uh, point to some of these. Uh, 
Uh, the first part of 1 Kings 6 is describing the construction of the building itself. So this, when, when Moses built the tabernacle, he set up the tent, and then he moved all the furniture in. Uh, that is the, that's like the creation pattern. You set the form, and then you fill it. God creates a heaven above, earth beneath, and waters under the earth. That's the first three days of creation. Then he fills the heavens above with sun, moon, and stars. The earth he fills with animals. The seas he fills with fish. So forming and then filling, that's the creation pattern. That's what Moses does when he builds the tabernacle. He forms the tabernacle, he sets up the tent, and then he moves in all the furniture. Uh, and that's what, uh, how 1 Kings 6 is set up. The opening 20-some verses is about the... Uh, uh, the, the, the uh, building itself, uh, which is made of stone. The interior is entirely paneled with cedar wood. So if you entered into the temple, you would not see any stone on the walls or on the floor. The floor is covered with gold. And you'd have cedar, you'd have cedar on all the walls, and the cedar is, has um, gold touches and decorations uh, representing plants and uh, some, other, some other things on the, on, that are uh, worked into the walls. Cedar is a, a very aromatic wood. Uh, and I think you'd, that, that would re remain, if you walked into the temple, it would feel like you're walking into a cedar grove with the, the aroma of cedar wood that's surrounding you. And it's like walking into a forest. Um, and there are, there are some places in the Bible that speak of the temple as being forest-like. Psalm, I think it's 74, talks about the enemies of God taking hatchets to the house of God, chopping down the house of God as if it were a forest, and it's describing the temple as a, as a grove. So you have the form of the temple built, and then uh, beginning in verse 23, you have a description of uh, the, the first new items that are added to the tabernacle. And these are two uh, th uh, freestanding cherubim. In the tabernacle, there are cherubim figures in the curtains that are woven into the curtains. There are cherubim uh, on the lid of the ark. Uh, but in addition to those, those are still in the temple. There are cherubim figures on the walls of the temple. Uh, there are cherubim, the, still the cherubim figures on the ark. But then there are two cherub, uh, cherubs, cherubim, uh, that are... Uh, made of what's called oil wood and these are um, uh, set up to uh, uh, flanking the ark in the most holy place. Uh, these are five cubits. They're ten cubits high. This is verse 23 of 1 Kings 6. Uh, ten cubits tall. So a cubit again is about a foot and a half. So these are, these are tall, 15 feet tall. Uh, they are, uh, each wing of the cherub is five cubits. So from wing to wing, the cherub is ten cubits. He's ten by ten. And the cherubs are formed so that their wings are spread out, 15 feet high, 15 feet from wing to wing. Uh, one cherub is here with his wing touching this side of the most holy place and the other wing at the middle. The other cherub is standing next to it, wing touching wing over here and wing touching the wall over here. So in the temple, you have four cherub figures, two on the ark and then two that are self-standing, uh, overshadowing the ark and, uh, and guarding the ark, as it were. Cherub are, cherubim are guardian fig, guardians. They're angelic guardians. That's what they are in uh, Genesis 3. The Lord sets cherubim at the gate of the garden to prevent Adam and Eve from getting past and entering into the garden again. And so you have the throne of the Lord, which is made up of cherubim, and then you have these two bodyguards, these two, uh, these two massive, bulky guardian cherubim that are guarding the throne. Okay. All right, so that's, that's new, more cherubim. And then uh, verses 29 and following describe the, thing, the things that are worked into the walls. Uh, you have engravings of cherubim, palm trees, open flowers, um, it's overlaid with gold on the floor. Um, so the, the, the cedar walls 
That's what it's talking about in verse 29. The cedar walls are decorated with cherubim. So when a priest walks into the most holy place, he's surrounded by cherubim. And that's an indication that he's in a kind of garden setting. You've got wood. It's like entering into a grove of trees. You've got cherubim. You're entering into a holy grove. There are palm trees carved into the wood. There's flowers carved into the wood. The whole thing is designed to... uh, to, uh, uh, to be a, an architectural form of a garden. And the high priest has the privilege, or the priests have a, priv- a privilege of serving in there. 